some nights we have nights of sleep where we get a number of hours that works really well for us and we wake up and we feel well rested and it wasn't hard to do. And then there are some nights where it's not like that. And we might wake up multiple times or we might have a hard time falling asleep and that happens. Insomnia is really basically a side effect of other things. And for most people, it's a side effect of not knowing that they're naturally wired to sleep. I didn't realize how much I was trying to do sleep to myself. Let my honesty spill out through the pages. You're listening to Escaping the Rat Race. I'm your host, Amy Leo, a singer, songwriter, and mental health educator. And our show is all about questioning the status quo and pushing the boundaries into what's possible for human beings and not probable. So tune in and get ready to escape the rat race, not only the monotonous nine to five work grind, but also that incessant internal mental chatter that prevents most of us humans from experiencing more joy, peace, clarity, and freedom. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on wherever you are in the world today. It is evening where I am. My name is Amy Leo, and I am your host. My guest today, Jen Lucas, is in the East Coast. She's in Charlottesville, Virginia, so it's the afternoon for her. So I am constantly amazed at how far technology has come and that it allows us (laughs) to do things like this. But that's neither here nor there. We have a fantastic, what I think is a fantastic show topic lined up today. We're going to be talking about insomnia. And one thing I've noticed, Jen, of course, feel free to to chime in here too with what you see. I've been seeing that sleep and the quality of sleep has been getting a lot of press lately. Ariana Huffington from the Huffington Post wrote this huge book about the importance of sleep. And, you know, she had this experience where she literally passed out, hit her head and broke, I think, her cheekbone or something like that. So there's a lot of how-tos on on trying to cope with insomnia and get better sleep. But I'm curious today, Jen, if you can share with us maybe a different way. But before we do that, if you can just introduce yourself. And I'd love to hear a little bit about your personal story and experience with what we call insomnia. Great. Well, thanks so much for having me on the show, Amy. It's such a pleasure to get to join you in this realm. Um, Yeah, so I was actually thinking about this ahead of time and just thinking, wait, how many years did I have difficulty sleeping? And I I realized it was 14 years on and off. So when I realized that, I was like, wow, that really was a long time. Um, So there were some big chunks of time where I slept fine in that. Um, but more than half of the time in that 14 year span, I, I would say I would describe myself as having insomnia. And most of that, I was taking a sleep medication or even sometimes two. And even actually at one point, um, I was working with a therapist and, you know, as therapists do, when you have insurance, they have the time where they have to sort of fill out a form, you know, and report back or something like give some sort of summary. And so when she would do that, she would ask me how much medication I was taking because somebody else was prescribing it for me. And when I would tell her, I just remember how she was shocked, legitimately shocked at the high dosage of what I was taking. And I I also remember that I did not like it, (laughs) that my care provider was shocked by how high my dose was. I kind of wanted to be like, really? That's the reaction you have for me? Um, But just to, I say that just to sort of give perspective because it was pretty bad. Um, It was bad enough that I, I had such a hard time sleeping that I could take a really high dose of one of my sleep medications and that it wouldn't make me groggy during the day. And so just to sort of bring legitimacy to her shock, the the medication that I was taking such a high dosage of, for most people, they would hardly be able to stay awake during the day because it wasn't a short acting medication. It was something that should have had me groggy during the day as well, but it totally didn't. Um, so I went for all these years really struggling with how to sleep. I mean, I read like every last article I could find on the different techniques, you know, like 
things that pe- I'm just going to throw some of them out there because I know that if you're listening to this show about insomnia, I'm assuming you've read some of these things like um, not to be around a screen, a computer screen or your phone screen or any screen because of the blue light, I guess, or something. I don't even know why. Yeah. I've actually heard that one too. Jen. Right. Like yeah. but right before bed, or maybe it's like within an hour of bed that you shouldn't be around a screen. Um, you know, have the lights down low, take a bath, um, you know, drink tea, um, stop doing things that would sort of potentially your mind might get busy with, um, things like that. Um, sometimes actually maybe there was the opposite of that. There was the, like, if you're thinking about your list of to do's, well then write them all down on a piece of paper so that you can be done thinking about it. So it went both ways, you know, um, uh, also the recommendation of don't use your bedroom or your bed for anything other than sleep or sex so that that's what your body associates it with. And I will just tell you that it just so happens that I'm not in my office today. I'm on my bed and I want to tell you, I have no trouble sleeping in it later. (laughs) (laughs) Um, so that's sort of my my personal, like the big picture of my personal journey. I really, like, I was really at a loss. Um, I didn't know what to do. I couldn't, and there was no like, um, common denominator really over the 14 years that I could find for that time where it was like the first time I had trouble sleeping, it was because of a side effect from a medication. Um, and then, you know, later I could sort of chalk it up to like being stressed about something I might you know, notice, oh, I've been having more trouble sleeping because I'm really stressed about that. But there were tons of times in that stretch where I would consider myself perfectly well adjusted and happy and not stressed and like think life was going along just fine and I still had trouble sleeping and I couldn't figure out anything. Um, Now, I want to say that there are times where that happens, where something medical could be going on. You know, like I know people who've, I'm just going to throw out one example. I am not a medical professional, but this is just one I've heard of from some friends where they started having trouble sleeping um, and they were about to enter menopause and their hormone levels had changed and they had changed so drastically that it made it hard for them to sleep. And once they took a little hormone something or used some supplement, they went right back to where they were before. So I don't mean to say anything about this conversation, about this topic that would point you away from what you might know to do in terms of seeking some sort of care to figure out if there's some huge change, if that makes sense. Um, For me, what ended up happening Um, If it's okay, if I just sort of dive into like, well, what did I learn? Because I've been sleeping just fine for over four years now. And so, huh, something changed. Um, Yes, I love it. The the typical, beautiful story of transformation. And that's what we're all about. So of course, Jen. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So um, what happened for me is, Amy, as you know, I started working almost five years ago with Jean Catherine. So she is um, sort of our common connection. Jean is my connection with Amy because we both hired her to be our coach. And so I was working in a year long program with Jean and I was beginning to, well, I was, I was learning things about my human experience and about the, the nature of thought and wisdom and intuition and those sorts of things. And it was really changing the way I showed up in life. And um, I was really enjoying life a lot more and um, doing things that I would have called before, like taking risks, only they totally didn't look like risks. And for, I don't know, probably for a couple months before I brought it up with Jean, I knew in my mind, I was like, you know, I probably could talk about sleep. I probably could bring this whole sleep thing here and there's probably something to it. So sure enough, I did. Like we, I brought it up um, with Jean, like, hey, is there something to this stuff that I'm learning that might help me with my sleep? Because I take sleep medicine every night. 
And we had some conversation and I don't remember the details of it, but it's basically um, the, this whole show, this whole, our whole conversation today will sort of point in the same direction that Jean pointed me the day we had a conversation. And six days later, um, I fell asleep uh, sort of accidentally without taking my sleep medication. And then I, I woke up about 15 minutes later and I was like, oh, I, I guess I'll just fall back to sleep and I won't take my medicine. And uh, so that's what I did. And I, I slept all night just fine. I didn't wake up at all. And, you know, this was at a time when I think I, think I might have only been taking one sleep medicine at that point. But it wasn't too far past a time when I had been taking two medicines. And the reason I took two was because one was for helping me fall asleep, but it wouldn't keep me asleep the whole night. And so I had that second one so that, I would, so that I'd be able to sleep a, the whole night. Um, but this night I fell asleep accidentally. I slept for eight hours. I woke up feeling great. And I did that for three whole weeks straight. And then I also, during that time, I took naps, which I was never able to take for years and years before that. Um, and, then I, and then I had a day where, um, a night where I couldn't, I had a very hard time sleeping. It was really fitful. I was a little anxious. Um, I didn't sleep for longer than like an hour and a half stretch. And then I would wake up and I would be antsy and I did not get a good night's sleep. And, um, and I, to be, if I'm totally honest, I kind of freaked out. <laughs> I did totally freak out. And, um, I was like, wait a minute, are you kidding me? I, I've been sleeping like I, um, the best sleep I've had in my life three weeks straight and it's all ruined. It's all a sham. You know, I mean, I was very dramatic. So that, that, that next night I was like, I'm just going to take my sleep medicine. So I did. And I felt awful about it because I really thought that I shouldn't need it. And what I remember is that the next day, so after these two nights, um, I actually had um, a time scheduled with Jean and I was a wreck because I was so caught up about it. I just thought that I was, I had messed it all up. And I just will never forget how, first of all, she let me be a mess. Um, and I remember it was beautiful that she just let me sort of fall apart and have tea and be a big fat mess. And then when we actually chatted about it, I told her how I'd been sleeping so great. And then I'd had this horrible night of sleep and then I'd taken my sleep medicine. And I just remember the, the way she said, so... Let me see if I understand this correctly, Jen. You thought that when you started sleeping well and not taking your sleep medication, that that meant that you would have this sort of ideal or perfect night of sleep every single night for the rest of your life. And I just, that was like the funniest thing I had ever heard. And I was still a little tied to it, you know? So I was like, well, well, yes. And I can see that that's really ridiculous now. <laughs> and so that for me was, was, what it, was what it took. And since then, what I would tell you about the way I sleep and the way I really can see that every single person on the planet has the potential for this. And I would say most people do this. Some nights we have nights of sleep where we get a number of hours that works really well for us and we wake up and we feel well rested and it wasn't hard to do. And then there are some nights where it's not like that. And we might wake up multiple times or we might have a hard time falling asleep and that happens. And I think that that's really typical, just in the same way that some days during the day, I might be like high strung and excited and then angry and then sad and then peaceful and, and happy. And it's like, there's sort of the, the full spectrum of feelings is available to us. And, and that same sort of, we can use that as a metaphor for our sleep at night. 
which is just that like, it's not going to be one flavor. It's not like when you go to get ice cream and there, it's just like, oh, I thought you only sold chocolate, but now you have six other flavors, but I thought there was only chocolate. Now it, it's ruined, you know? It's not like that. There, there were just always the flavors and it's only in our minds that we could really invent a story that would make it that we're supposed to have a certain kind of sleep experience. And so that's what I have seen for myself is, so this is sort of the, the point of hope. If, if you're out there and um, you have insomnia or who cares if you call it that actually, maybe sometimes you have trouble sleeping and you wonder how it could be better and you don't know what to do and you've tried stuff and it hasn't worked. And what I would say is that we as humans are wired to sleep when it's time. You don't have to believe that if that sounds like what, but I'm guessing that for most people, it might sound like, oh, well, that, that makes some sense, right? I mean, think about it. Animals do this. They go to sleep when they're tired and, and then they wake up and then they, they go find their food or shelter or whatever. And humans are literally the same way. So it's just the same as when I know I need to go to the bathroom or um, if I know that I'm hungry, it's the same thing about knowing sleep and when it's time for sleep and being able to do that. And I mean, if we're honest, it's really about anything. We always know what to do all the time and we have the capacity to do that. I mean, sleep is like wired into our beings and there's actually like scientific research that shows us that, you know, I mean, like when there's research that tries to keep people awake, it can't be done. Like people get to the point where they literally cannot keep themselves awake. They, get, they try everything. I mean, I wish I had looked up some of that cool research, but there's like all kinds of things like bright light, loud music, making people stand up or walk or, but you know, you get to a certain point and your whole body will just refuse to do anything. It will, it will force sleep upon you. And so that's sort of the extreme of it. And before you get to that extreme, there's the wiring that's in us. There's the, the wisdom that's in us that wants to sleep when it's time because we need to recharge. And there are systems in our body that count on that recharging. And, and that's what, Amy, you were referring to when you were talking about like the, all those articles on the importance of sleep. They're talking about how, what we know about how important it is to have it because of how much stuff it impacts. And then people think, oh, well, you have to pay, like that because it's so important to get it, there's a certain level of attention that we would need to pay to getting that sleep when it, it, it's just so important that our bodies are wired for it. And so they make us do it. And so, so I know for myself that if I had heard this before I found it easy to sleep, I would have been like, you do not know what it's like. I have tried this. If it were that important, why won't the sleep happen? And um, and I guess what I can really throw in there for, for what I've seen for myself, and the same has been true for, for other people I know, like my clients and, um, and friends who've had this shift, is that when you understand that your mind is keeping you awake, but that you might not see how it is keeping you awake, then there's something in there. There's like a, there's a curiosity or a, like a reflection or an investigation that you could bring to wondering about, okay, well, if I'm wired to sleep and it's only sort of my busy mind in some way that could keep me awake, um, then what occurs to you? You know, what happened for me is that my mind let go without me having to tell it. I just hadn't realized how much I was trying to do my sleep. So that might even be more useful, actually, than what I just said about 
about sort of thought and the mind because I didn't realize how much I was trying to do sleep to myself. And, and there's something about knowing that sleep will just overtake us, you know, if we, and there's not even an if, sleep will overtake us. When it's time to sleep, it will happen. And, and I know that everybody is familiar. I'll give a, I'll just give an example of like a time when you override it. So recently I've actually been overriding my instinct to sleep um, quite a lot recently because I've, I've been paying attention to my idea about how much there is to get done. And there's so many things I need to do and I have to take care of everything that I've been overriding my own drive to sleep. When I've, when I've noticed that I've been sleepy, I'll just override it. And, um, fortunately me, fortunately for me lately, I've, I've, um, I've decided that's not a good idea. I should really listen when I, when I need to sleep. And uh, so last night I was falling asleep at like 9.40 PM. And I totally could have just set my book down and gone to sleep right then. But I decided to get up because I've recently started making my own kombucha and it was really time for me to like flip over a back batch and, and bottle it. And so I decided, I just knew like, Jen, you know that right now you could literally just fall asleep, no problem. And it, this is the time to go to sleep, but uh, you want to make the kombucha. So just go do it, but get right back in bed and don't let, because once you, once you override, there are biological things that kick in, you know, you have this like adrenaline rush. I don't know the other, all the other hormones. I don't know if it's cortisol that kicks in, but things kick in to keep you awake. And so I knew that that would kick in and that that would have an impact on me. And what, what happens for me is that then I will sort of ride that and think like, okay, well then I can keep staying awake because I don't have that strong urge to go to sleep. So I just, I went downstairs and I bought my kombucha and I came back upstairs and I got in bed and I turned out the lights, even though I wasn't as sleepy. And it, it took me, I don't know, probably like 15 minutes to fall asleep. Whereas if I had just gone, gone to sleep the first time, oh my God, I would have been right out. It was so powerful, that urge to sleep. Um, and so I give that as an example because I, I can like watch my experience and I'm curious about it right now. I'm like in this curiosity place of, okay, I, I could go to sleep and I'm just going to override this. So I know that everybody's done that. I am sure of it that there have, everybody's had the chance to have the experience of being sleepy. And then most, for most of us, we think, well, I can't sleep right now. And so we have to sort of force ourselves to be awake, right? Like that's, that's what happens is we think we have to stay awake. But I, I think that what's happening for, for those of us when we actually have a hard time sleeping and we're wishing we could sleep is that we, we are innocently keeping ourselves awake without knowing it. And so for me, the simplicity of really falling back on knowing that the, the system of life, the, the way that he, all human beings are designed is to include sleep. Just like digestion is included and just like my heart beating is included and breathing is included, sleep is wired that way too so that we, we can't always override it. So if you know like you can't always override it, and even when people say, well, I have insomnia or, or you've heard people say like, oh my God, last night I didn't get any sleep. Well, that is almost never what people mean. Yeah. When, <laughs> people just mean, boy, that sucked. And I only got like five hours and it was fitful, you know, like, do you, have you said that before, Amy, where you're like, I got no sleep, but you don't mean that. Oh, of course. Of course. And I think it's funny when my, my fiance um, notices that I, I'm having a hard time sleeping. He's like, oh, was it another lizard night? <laughs> I'm like, a night of lizard. like, wow, what a, what a way to put like a lightheartedness to it and, and normalizing yeah. it, I guess, instead of pathologizing it. Right. That's such a great, great point too, because I, um, 
I actually did another podcast. I think we, we called it like why insomnia is all made up. And, and so what you're just, it points to what you were just saying, um, which is just that like what I see really is that when we call this insomnia, that's taking our idea of the way it works and sort of applying it over time right? That we say, I've got insomnia as if that's a thing, which means I'm not even really sure what it means. I'm not sure what the, what the definition is, to, if I'm totally honest. But some, if I'm going to guess right now, it's something about, um, you know, over time, having difficulty sleeping and not getting enough sleep, something like that. And, but the thing is that what I know is that if I think that I have insomnia, then I think that there's something wrong that needs to be fixed. And it's just more practical to look in the direction of, oh, but, but what if I'm wired to sleep? What if when sleep needs to happen, it, it will just overtake me? It will. Now, I might lie awake for a long time, but eventually sleep will come and I literally won't be able to stop it. I, it won't even be in my power. It's kind of like the wisdom that's built into an acorn that it can only become an oak. It can't become a maple, you know, like the, that's just built in. And when we look more at the sort of the, what are we designed to do rather than in the direction of what's wrong and what needs to be fixed, then we're looking in a direction that just makes more sense. Because you, you, that's just easier. I mean, it's just inherently easier. When we look at something and we see a problem and we try to use our analytical minds to fix it, that's inherently limited. But, but when, we, when we look in the direction of, well, what's already here? Like, how is the system already designed? Then, then there's something bigger than me, Jen Lucas, at work. And that is naturally just more intelligent. So, so I can look in the direction of, well, I'm designed to sleep. I just think that there's something wrong. And, and I, I just want to put in here that this includes there actually being something wrong. So doing what I'm saying doesn't prevent you from going to the doctor if that's what's needed. In fact, that will make it clearer. In, in my experience, it makes it clearer what to do that will actually be useful if there is something to be done. But when we look in the direction of, oh my God, I cannot even believe this problem. It's so massive. How am I ever going to get past it? We're so worked up in moments that it's harder to see solutions. That's, that's been my experience. And if we even go sort of to more of the truth of it, when we're thinking about our experience that way, it's coming to us through thought in the moment. So when it's 2 p.m. and I am by uh, the sort of schedule of my day and what I think about what's required of me to do, um, I know that I'm not going to be able to go to sleep until 8.30 p.m. or later. Because this is me today, right? I'm not going to be able to go to sleep until 8.30 p.m. or later. And so if I know that, then thinking about or worrying about or planning for my uh, quote-unquote insomnia doesn't make any sense because it's not happening right this minute. And so th that's another sort of useful bit that I see now. It, it's not part of what I saw at the time that I sort of woke up from my insomnia. Um, but it is what I can really see now. If I am worried about something um, that isn't happening, then it's, it's, that's just my experience in the moment. Like that, that's it. I'm just thinking about it. And there's nothing to be done. And oh, it's just so helpful. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. just sort of, you know what I mean? I'm like finding myself sort of marveling at that just right now in this moment. It applies to everything, not just whether I can sleep or not. Mm -hmm. There's so many goodies that you've, that you've shared, Jen. 
And a few things that I've seen in my own experience have really resonated uh, with what you've been sharing. You know, when you said the acorn bit metaphor, I kind of giggled because I've really seen the trend of myself included, but (laughs) human beings in at least the culture that I am privy to, you know, it's like we're an acorn, but then we try to be a cactus. And if we're not a cactus, then we get down on ourselves and think of all the ways that we could be a cactus. And (laughs) And maybe to put this in, if, so, if someone is a listener, it's not really good with the metaphors, but w- more practically, what I see happen time and time and time again is we get concepts about things in the world. So again, eight hours, quote unquote, of sleep is the right amount of sleep. And if we get this amount of sleep, then we'll have all these benefits, health-wise, mental health-wise, et cetera. And that completely disregards that every individual's process and moment to moment experience and their needs, physical needs are actually different. It isn't a one size fits all model. And again, when we stick so firmly to concept and belief, which we are also biologically wired to do it. And a lot of us don't even recognize the power that belief has, but when we're going through that experience and then it's like, we're adding more layers, more barriers to sleep. Because yeah. now we're afraid. Can we leave it if we don't get enough sleep? Oh my gosh! Then, then, then this will happen. I actually read that one of the one of the side effects of not getting sleep was like a decreased, decreased or um, lessened or less satisfying sex life. Right. So I mean, we, oh yeah. <laughs> what I find is that if you want to believe something, you can Google and find the research to back that. <laughs> <laughs> Regardless, <laughs> and, and I do find that. Um, Diagnoses, exactly what you said, Jen, it can be immensely helpful. But when we look at diagnoses, if it's a mental health diagnosis, if it's something like insomnia, that's a snapshot of experience in time. But what we do as a culture is that we begin to use those verbs as if they're nouns, as if we are an insomniac. I am depressed. Right. And the truth of the matter is that can never be. Human beings are verbs. We're constantly in motion. Yeah, I love that. So I love I, that. Yeah. I just think it's so important for listeners, again, that, you know, Jen and I aren't trying to, you know, discredit or, or put, you know, bow ties on any pain or suffering that you're having with lack of sleep. But the truth is life is always changing. Mm-hmm. And what you are going through now will change and shift through time. And it's that awareness, exactly what you said, Jen of being really attuned to, okay, well, this happened 14 years ago. And then four years ago, my experience was this. And now my experience is this. And, and, yeah. and, and that's the only place that you can ever, you, me, anyone can ever take action from. Yeah. We can't try to act 10 years from now. We have no idea. It's just so comical. Oh <laughs> we think God. we're fortune tellers. It's, it's so <laughs> funny. Well, that's actually that I'm going to tell you, I want to tell a share a story about a, a client of mine. Um, so we had, um, this, this sleep talk topic came up and she was, um, sh- she was kind of like acting like a fortune teller every night. She would do this every night and she could see that she was doing it. She, um, uh, she is a nurse and really had this, like, I got to be on my toes. I really need to be well rested. There's, a, you know, there's a lot going on. It's really important that I'm able to be alert and pay attention and people's lives are at stake and, you know, all of that. Right. And so you can see how like this whole thing about sleep and the importance of getting a lot of sleep, she was really worked up about. And so if she would go to bed and she couldn't fall asleep right away, then what she was doing was she was calculating how many hours she could still sleep and then what that would mean about her day. She was literally fortune telling her next day. And then she would think, oh my God, I'm only going to get seven hours of sleep. And what is that going to mean for my day? And just like running, you know, like a hamster on the wheel. Right. Um, And that would keep her awake because then she was worried and then she, her mind was really busy. And so what happened for her, actually, she listened to something, she listened to a podcast I had done on insomnia. And then um, two days later, I talked to her and she's like, you know, I, I was, there I was lying awake and it was midnight. And I was thinking about how I was, I was going to have a bad day the next day. I wasn't going to be rested enough. And then, and then I was like, wow, I'm, I'm really I'm really thinking about that and it's not happening yet. And I could just go to sleep right now. And then she fell right asleep. 
<laughs> she, and, I, and I just remember having this conversation with her where I had like booked an hour long conversation and it was so fresh and alive when she was like marveling about it. And we ended up only talking for 20 minutes because I was like, you really, you really found for yourself what you needed you know, like a go forth and sleep, you know, and, and the only thing we ended up talking about in that 20 minutes was how it wasn't going to be the same every night. It was that like, you know, that, that, that thing that you were talking about, how we're verbs, we're not static, we're changing. And so that that's the thing is like, don't forget that that it might change, but you don't have to freak out or plan ahead or fortune, be a fortune teller about that either. Um, so I, I love that. And, and for this woman, she actually sort of could see for herself what was happening when the change happened to her and she was able to sleep better. For me, that's not what happened. I literally just fell asleep by accident without like remembering to take my sleep medicine or whatever. That's just what happened to me. Um, and there have also been times since I had this change where I've had like what I would definitely call a bad night of sleep. And the next day I was definitely tired and I knew better. Now I know better than to think there's a thing happening to me. Like Amy was talking about, this was so wise what you said, like where we can sort of put a category on it and then we turn it into something that we have to worry about, which is not helpful. It's just, there's no need to worry about it. There might be a point of action. Like I would, I would, I'll just make up a scenario right now. It, it's neither here nor there about what actually the future would bring, but I'll just give an example. Like I'm just guessing that if I had two weeks in a row where every single night I had a hard time sleeping and my sleep was fitful, it would probably occur to me to wonder what's going on. Because that would be really unusual for me. Actually, I would say that even if that happened three days in a row for me, that would be unusual for me. That would be different. I probably wouldn't do anything about it right away, but it might occur to me, like, what's different? I wonder if something's different, right? And then I don't know what I would do, but I, I can tell you right now that I wouldn't go to the place of thinking I have insomnia. Because I've seen for myself that, that that doesn't exist. Insomnia is really basically a side effect of other things. And for most people, it's a side effect of not knowing that they're naturally wired to sleep and, and that they're actually their minds are busy in some way that they don't even necessarily know about. Now, some people do know their minds are busy and they're trying to figure out how to quiet it. You don't need to figure out how to quiet your mind either. You can just look in the direction of you're wired for sleep. And, and, and if that doesn't do it, I, I, I guess I want to put out there, if anybody listens and gets to the end of the show and, and they're wondering like, wait, I don't get it. I don't think this, I don't, I don't understand. And, and I want to know more. I just want to invite that. I, I would be happy to talk to anybody who's wondering about this. Um, and, and you can find me at jen at divineplay.com. Um, and I really, I, like, it's such a passion of mine. It's made such a difference in my life to see the simplicity of sleep being built into us and that, that, that it's as really as simple as that and that there's nothing that you have to worry about. That if you can't sleep, worrying isn't helping or stressing about it isn't helping. And, and it can be as simple as looking in the direction of, really knowing that it's possible that we're wired to sleep. And, and now I'm actually curious about those, those research studies I mentioned earlier, Amy, where they actually do research to try to see how long people can be kept awake, like fighting and fighting and fighting, trying to stay awake. And um, I want to say that there's some sort of cutoff around the 36 hour mark where people find it incredibly hard to stay awake, that, that they're having to like, I don't know if there's some sort of mechanical thing that holds people's eyes open. And <laughs> I don't even know. But, but that, like, what if you knew that that really is true, that we're wired to sleep and that, 
that our, our minds can override it and that there's nothing you have to do with your mind in order to fix that. That, that you can just know that there's something bigger than your little personal monkey mind that knows to sleep in the same way that you know to breathe or for your heart to beat. And it's really true. It's the same, it's the same kind of thing as when you've been sitting in the same position for a long time and without thinking, you just move your position because you've, you've like, you got a little uncomfortable and you don't even pay any attention to it. You just do it. Sleep is like that too. And the, the only thing, if that's not happening for you, then, then the only thing at work is that thought is creating our experience moment to moment. And so if you find yourself worried about it or, or awake and frustrated, that, that is thought at work, creating your experience. And, and it's really simple to know that. If you're frustrated or anxious or worried about sleep or anything else, that's, that's coming to you via thought. I almost said what occurred to me to say actually was via the, the thought station on the TV, you know, like turn the channel. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I, I just, I really love what you're pointing people to in such a simple way. You know, if as a listener, you're saying, oh yeah, I know about thought. I've read Tony Robbins books and I was a trainer in this and that. I really invite you to just maybe stop for a second. And what I find, Jen, is that the link between the mind and the body is vastly underestimated in our culture. And you can start to even do research for yourself on this and look up things like self-fulfilling prophecy, which is exactly what your client, the nurse, experienced. Yeah. You know, and, and we're so quick to blame any and everything outside of ourselves because people think that there's a need to blame it all. But right. what if there isn't? What if this is just how the system works? There's a really common assumption underneath this as well, this uh, leaning into what's naturally at work is that people really believe that in order for things to happen in their life, that they have to work at it. They have to get in there. They have to do something about it. But what if that is not the case? What if the best ideas, and they've shown this physiologically, that your best ideas tend to come when you are in an open-minded position or state of mind, when you aren't stressed, Stress, of course, affects our body, our biochemistry. It literally, well, in some studies, has dropped IQs, yeah, <laughs> people's yeah. IQs. And, and so this kind of fallacy that we don't talk about often, the fact that, well, yes, Jen and I aren't saying that there are real things that, of course, you need your intellect to attend to, but thinking that your best solutions come from that habitual, overactive 2 a.m. thinking, maybe starting to also investigate that. And seeing is it really as fruitful as you as you think it is? Yeah, I really love what you just said there. That 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 it's what we're pointing to is that sleep doesn't have to be work. In fact, it never really is. That even when you do fall asleep, it's not because you figured it all out and you finally found the right combination of factors to line up for yourself, that's not ever what's actually happening. <laughs> what, what's happening is that your body really just needs sleep and it will do that. And the work is not required. And, and I'm just here to tell you, there are plenty of times where I am literally looking at my computer and I fall asleep. <laughs> and so the, the whole screen thing, I'm like, yeah, I don't know. And, uh, <laughs> and I mean, so the, all those things, like I, I don't do any of those formula things unless it occurs to me, like to, to be like, wow, gosh, a bath just sounds so great. That would just be the best thing to do before this night of sleep. Like, sure, I'll do that sometimes, but not because I'm thinking that that will put me to sleep because now I know that's not actually the thing that happens. We, 
don't have to work. I love that you pointed that out, Amy. We don't actually, and there's something that I want to connect it to what you said about the mind and the body, because um, we talk about this mind-body connection. And recently I heard something that sort of twisted my mind in a way that I thought was really cool, which is just like, we talk about the mind-body connection actually as, as if they're separate. And, and I think that's pretty funny when you look at it because they're not, yeah. they're literally not separate. And the only way we can talk about them as separate is with our minds. Like we, we, like our ideas make them separate. They're literally not the mind and the body are one. Like there's this oneness to life, right? And if there's oneness to life that includes being able to sleep, doesn't that make more sense to be curious about that? And if you find yourself working hard to sleep, I would just say, like if there's an invitation I could give to listeners, I would say, you know, if you have this big routine and you think that's the thing that's working for you or not quite working for you, but you think it will, are you willing to try something else? Like you could put a time limit on it. Maybe you say it's just for one night or maybe you say it's for three nights or I don't care what it is. But if you're curious about what if I weren't working so hard to sleep and see what occurs to you, I'm curious about that for people. Like what if I didn't work so hard? Huh. And then really see like what, what does happen? Like I don't know what comes after that. I don't have any, I wouldn't want to give any suggestions, but if you're out there and you are thinking that you need to work hard for sleep, I just throw out there, what if you're curious about, okay, well, what if I didn't work hard? What would that look like? And see what happens. And I'd, I would actually love to hear about it. I'm sure you would too, Amy, like, right? Like, let's, let's hear if people do this, run this experiment. And, and I would love to hear what happens. It's just so, such an uncommon suggestion mm-hmm. that sometimes I do think people initially have a reaction and whatever reaction you're having as a listener is totally cool. <laughs> I mean, that's how your system Fine. works. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we can't get away from our opinions of life, but you know, again, I just invite not to maybe discount so, so quickly um, that, that it couldn't be that easy. Well, well, what if it could be? Right. I mean, I certainly don't claim to have a, a lockdown of all knowledge about the universe and the human body. And I, I don't think there's anyone out there that can kind of say that either, which, right. which kind of brought me to, I guess, maybe a little bow, a bow tie, putting a bow on today's show. But it brings me back to one of the first things that you sh- shared about you had this transformative experience where you were now able to sleep and then you felt like you backpedaled. And I also want to point listeners that that's exactly the same kind of thinking that we do when we think we can't sleep or we think we're doomed the next day. And what I mean by that is I see again that people try so hard to get out of being human and it's exhausting. Mm. It is so normal. You don't have to learn something, have a transformed experience, and then feel you need to be a robot or a guru or enlightened. It doesn't tend to work that way. And even people that have had enlightenment experiences, they still are human. They still have bad days. (laughs) We're physical form. We can't get out of this. So I think that, you know, for me, it's just been beautiful to see a natural bubbling of humility start to surface more and more and more. The more I realize like, Hey, whoa, baby, I'm super flawed. And so is everyone else around me. (laughs) And you know what? It's actually okay. It's actually okay. I can still solve problems better than I ever have before. I can deal with negative emotions. I experience them with much more lightheartedness. This may sound really weird to listeners, but um, I did have an experience actually last night, Jen. I was in uh, Cologne, Germany, and I usually don't have that much trouble falling asleep, but I did last night, which is ironic. (laughs) (laughs) And I was a little nervous. I had to go to a, a government office in Germany and I don't speak German. So I was, you know, getting all this, oh, well, what if this happens? And, da, da, da. and it was really interesting that um, I saw that I was in an anxious mood 
And I actually had a little smirk come across my face because it reminded me that I'm still human, no matter how many podcasts I host, no how many clients I have, no matter how many books I read or seminars I go to. It was almost a really gentle reminder and and the knowing that, okay, this is what it is right now. It it, it doesn't mean anything other than what I think it means. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. For yeah, it actually reminds me of that phrase it is what it is, that there's something about life where we have the capacity to say, this is good, or this is bad, or I want this experience versus that experience. And when it comes down to it, the only thing that really exists is the present moment. And that present moment just is what it is. And then that's followed by more present moments. And we just string them together in life. And that, that's all that's happening ever. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, well, th- this actually flew by. <laughs> the experience of time. We're almost out of present moments together, Jen. <laughs> Hopefully I'll see you in Charlottesville in October. Love we're it. We're actually hosting, hosting a, an awesome event where we're going to be yes. about not only insomnia, but all the other kind of <laughs> holes we get into. Well, as long as you've mentioned that, we can tell people to go to theawesomeevent.com to learn more about that event at the end of October. Perfect. And Charlottesville is a beautiful place. It's one of my many second, third, or fourth homes. I've got <laughs> but it's a beautiful place and you'd meet Jen and myself and Jean. So I really encourage listeners to reach out about that piece too. Before we let you go, um, again, if you can share where people can can find you, because I know that there is definitely something for listeners, uh, a benefit for, for reaching out to you and the clarity that you have on this issue. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, um, I'm, I'm at two places. I have a website, jenlucas.us. That's L-U-C-A-S. I have that website. And then I'm also um, uh, the operations manager and senior associate at Divine Play. So that's at divineplay.com. But anybody can email me at Jen at Divine Play. I'd love, I would love to hear from anybody who um, is listening and has any kind of story to share or has any questions. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for having me on today, Amy. Absolutely. You can even reach out to her if you're skeptical or something Abs- angered you or upset you. We're yes. actually okay with that. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Before I definitely was not, but now I, it's becoming more peaceful most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. That I'm was really so great. Tickled. Yeah. I really, I really enjoy this, this, this adventure. One more question, Jen, before you go. Um, what is your favorite thing about being human? Love. Love. That's my favorite. My favorite thing is that because of love, I get to experience the richness of life. And what popped into my head was my son, who I love so much, and my grandfather, who just died last night. And I'm so grateful for being human that I get to experience loving particular people and being attached to them and loving moments of life and the richness that 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 gives. Beautiful, Jen. You're such a wonderful soul. I'm so glad we've crossed paths. voice and his songwriting skills and music skills with us. He actually was inspired by 
Jen's interview so much that that he he wrote a song about it, which is so uh, wonderful and just shows again the creative potential, how it works through all of us really differently and arises in beautiful ways. So today's real story before we end out the show is Woman Has a Healthy Baby Against All Odds. The woman's name is Tiffany Parker. She is a fellow singer-songwriter and my words can't do justice to her story. I mean, the short of it is she's just a remarkable young woman that has endured a debilitating and at times life-threatening autoimmune disorder since she was 21. So that was about five years ago or so now. And you can click through to her blog posts by subscribing to our show. All you've got to do is type in your search engine, Escaping the Rat Race with Amy Leo. You can do that on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, basically wherever you get your podcast fix from, we will be there. We do put all the links and references in the show notes. So again, you'll be able to find the specific blogs for Tiffany Parker that really, again, show that she is a miracle and the, and the health of her baby is, is an absolute miracle. So if you, if you want to get that information as well as any information that we shared regarding Jen Lucas, again, all you got to do is subscribe there, Escaping the Rat Race with Amy Leo. And next week, we're going to be talking with Marina Pearson Summers about relationships. She talks a little bit also about her business journey. And we'll also be diving in just just the tip of the iceberg on exploring sexuality. So that is what we have for next week, which is uh, definitely a different kind of show than we usually do. But we're all about keeping it fresh and and keeping an open mind and, and learning here. So until next time, keep rocking. My name is Amy Leo. Thank you so much for listening.